starting with the seminar reviews, and um, so it's a two-hour session. Um, it's a presentation by Professor Emmanuel Sanchez, followed uh, by a presentation by artist in residency here at Zetka or uh, Rico, but I can call you Yin? Yang. Yang, okay. Um, and then the idea is to have a group discussion, um, so any question is welcome, followed probably by mutual questions and debate amongst uh, you two. Okay, so Professor Manuel Santos from the University, Associate Professor of the University of Rio, is that Yeah, correct? Federal University, Federal of, University of, Rio. of Rio. will talk about, um, so what's a trivialization? Uh, what is it? <laughs> uh, artistic action in preserved space, cultural identity or touristic trivialization, and then um, Yan Yan um, will tell us about a world without a manual and the work he's doing recycling um, <laughs> objects. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for. <laughs> thank you for introducing me as a professor. In fact, ah. I'm a retired professor, uh, <laughs> fortunately, and uh, I'm going to try to make it a little bit more informal, because in fact this, uh, this kind of space is a little bit formal. Uh, one guy behind the table and the audience on the other side, uh, this is not so nice, uh, especially in an in occasion like this, where everybody knows uh, something to teach to other people. So I start saying this and uh, also remember you that uh, there is a long time that I do not speak English, uh, a long time that I'm not more in the school, so uh, sometimes I'm going to make a little bit of mistakes and uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, this is a research that I'm doing in the, another university in Rio. It's a Catholic university. I used to be in the Federal University of Rio. And nowadays, I'm doing this research for the Catholic universities on this issue of artistic intervention during the World Cup and the Olympics. You know that the World Cup um, uh, is right beginning in, in Brazil, and then particularly in, in Rio. And also this, in uh, 2016, we're going to have the Olympics there. Uh, those are huge events with million people came to, to Rio and uh, Rio is a cultural landscape um, according to UNESCO so it's really beautiful um, and uh, the question is how is going to be this relationship between the native guys and the uh, people that are coming just to for consumption this uh, kind of uh, landscape and things like this. And uh, what is going to be the uh, role of artists in uh, trying to create an identity not only with the people living in Rio, but also with the people um, coming to the city. Because in fact, this is a world heritage. This is not more, more a local heritage. So, this is the first step of the, the, of the research. In this first step, I made some interview with some artists and some other interviews with some uh, public officials responsible to manage the, the World Heritage Area. From the interviews, I extracted some pair of positions. You know that uh, in social science, normally in anthropology, or sociology or uh, those kind of social science, normally we, you, we used to uh, try to analyze the discourse of the interviewees, uh, extracting from those discourses some pairs of a position that uh, I should say command uh, the thought that they have when they look to uh, some uh, object of analysis. So I extracted four pairs of oppositions 
And I, I'm quite sure that uh, this kind of analysis would be uh, nice to understand the relationship between uh, natives and uh, visitors, and also what is the role of the ar ar artist uh, in doing this passage between these two groups. Well, the first pair of opposition is between exotic and native. If you look to the, to the, to the pictures, you know, I say, well, I don't see much difference between the exotic and the native. What do you mean by this? What the interviewer, the people, mean by creating this opposition between exotic and native look? At the beginning, I was in doubt. I was using exotic and endogenous. But in fact, the best way is exotic and native. Begin with exotic. Exotic, what it, what it means? It's exotic. It means that it's a vision that is outside the object. You, you, and you see there, I don't know if you can uh, repair this, but you see that in the first image, you have the people playing uh, with these figures of balls and the head and things like this. Brazilian guys always have a football in their heads. And the audience that is behind in the stands. In the other side, this is an image of the Brazilian carnival. And in the other side, there is no audience. Everybody is participating. There is no people looking looking to the exotic. There is no people with this kind of uh, glaze, exotic glaze. All the people are inside participating of the party. So this is an important difference. And it is natural. Of course, if I'm, if I'm going to another country that I do not know uh, the parties, uh, well, probably I will be outside too. So this is the difference between a tourist that is outside and the native that is inside of the parties. And this is the first um, contradiction, the first opposition, better, better to say opposition than contradiction, that I, that I found in the interviews of artists and officials. And this is another uh, opposition, another power of opposition that I found in the interviews. And this is because part of this, the interviewed people were artists, and the other part were officials, people, authorities, people responsible for uh, protecting the heritage. So there is a contradiction between preserve it and use it. From the point of view of the official, the most important thing is to preserve the cultural heritage. From the point of view of the artist, on the contrary, is to use the heritage. For instance, uh, here is Copacabana, uh, this is Ipanema, uh, and uh, during a summer uh, Sunday, uh, you see there a lot of people using this heritage. This is a heritage, this is a beach that is a heritage of real heritage. And the other side is um, Pão de Açúcar, Corcovado, with Christ the Redeemer, uh, in, a, in a beach that is uh, Praia Vermelha. It's a uh, um, not very well known beach for the tourists. People, the local people know very well, but they do prefer Copacabana because for the native guys, this is not only to bath, this is conviviality, this is interaction, this is to be with the other guys, to be what they are with the other guys that are identical to them. So the tourists are looking for the different, and you, you have saw this, you have seen this in the, in the first uh, slide. They are looking for the difference, for, for the different. The guy with the ball in the head. Uh, and, uh, but the natives are looking for the identical. And that's why we, we say cultural identity. So, uh, 
for the third opposition that I found there was about the sacred and the profane. Uh, normally people think that sacred is much more related with uh, religiosity. This is not true. Soccer, for instance, could be sacred in the sense that there is a deep emotion uh, when, we, when you play soccer, especially when it is for the national team, there is uh, a space that should be, that is sacred for one team that should be preserved. And there is another space, there is the other team that should be preserved by the other team. And the idea is just to disagree the other team. And people live this emotion, this emotion profoundly, except if you are a person that like baseball, for instance, and then you go to see um, the, the static of the game. But if you leave the game, then you're gonna leave the emotion for your team, national team or local team. You can have this difference in local team. And uh, so the sacred is much more to leave this emotion in a sense that you have to preserve something, you have to save something against the other. And the profane is the opposite of this. And so uh, you can see for the second image, there is a woman pretending to be Christ the Redeemer. Well, for a man, for some men particularly, or even for some Catholic women, this could be a profanation. Of course, on the other side, for some women, this could be a political gesture in the sense that she's saying that God is not a man, God is a woman. And this is the same that we have seen in the case of football match. There is always different positions. The sacred for one is the profane for the other and vice versa. Well, the fourth position that I found in the interviews is between cultural identity and tourist consummation. There's a mistake here. This is a tourist consummation. Uh, you see that um, nowadays um, images or heritages can be captured through a mobile phone and immediately communicate with thousands of people all over the world with different cultures. But basically, when we are tourists, we are making photos about the beautiful, about the ideal. We go to a country and we see a church, we see a landscape, we see even a people, exotic people for you. And then you got a picture and send to mama. Hello, mama. Look. What a beautiful guy or a beautiful woman is this with the ball in the head and things like this. So, normally we do not photograph the ugly, the violence, the poverty. Just the artists and the professionals do that. When you are a tourist, you are not looking for a, a poor guy in Venice and trying to photograph this poor guy or trying to photograph a violence in, in Venice, you are trying to look for the beautiful space in Venice. And then, you see in this uh, second image, this is a, a so-called wild safari. So, they are visiting a favela in Rio as if it was a safari. On the other side are the violence are uh, the, the wild, uh, I would say, even the animals. Uh, and this side are we, making photos, in this case, of this uh, violence and uh, ugliness and poverty. But in fact, these three things do not pertain 
to the hotel lobbies. When you go to the hotel lobbies, you don't see photos on these aspects of a city, any city. On the other side, so this is a kind of touristic consummation. And the other side, you have the cultural identity in the sense that, for instance, nobody knows what is this. This is a game that we play in the beats of Rio, a game called Altino. Tourists never understand this. Even the Carioca guys, the people that live in Rio, do not understand what, is, what, what Altino is. Because Altino is not a game when a person has to win the other. It's a game that everybody participates like uh, a little bit like the indigenous, uh, the Brazilian indigenous from Amazon, that the game has to end match it. Nobody has to win the game. The game has to end zero to zero, one to one, two to two. And this is absolutely strange for a person that is not from that culture. Well, this is the four basic pair of oppositions that I found in this uh, interview. This is important for me because uh, I'm going to apply this to uh, construct some questionnaires in the second phase to, op to apply to tourists and uh, cariocas to see what they think about uh, each other. So, but I, what all these have to do with uh, our question of artistic intervention in um, heritage, in, uh, uh, I would say sacred space of heritage. Well, uh, let's see, this is a symbol of real. Everybody knows. This is uh, Christ the Redeemer. Probably you don't realize uh, here because he is not seen in the top of the mountain. Normally you see the photo of the Christ in the top of the mountain uh, guarding the city of Rio. Uh, we, we normally say that God is Brazilian. So, uh, in fact, God is, is Carioca and uh, he is looking for the city. But uh, uh, in this case, the, the most amazing is that this statue was made by one French guy, an Italian guy, and one Brazilian, three artists that made this image in 1930. And this image became the symbol of Rio, the symbol of a cultural identity. So three foreigners, or at least two foreigners, two different guys that made the identity of Rio. And also, it was a, a work of art, because uh, at this moment, to make, to make article for an image of a uh, Catholic church, this, it was almost a profanation. It was necessary to convince the cardinals uh, who says perhaps the Pope, to say, no, this is a very modern 1930s. This is very modern, but it represents uh, a new Christianism. Anyway, this symbol is a symbol of Rio, but it was made by, not by a tourist, but by an artist that were from another country. This also is a symbol of Rio de Janeiro. It's included, both are included and uh, preser preserved area by UNESCO. So as a cultural landscape. These waves are so beautiful and so identified with Copacabana that everybody in the world when see this kind of uh, uh, waves remember Copacabana immediately. Well, the strange is that this design was not made by a Brazilian and even not made in Brazil. It was made in the first time in the Largo do Rocio in Lisbon in 1843, a hundred 
and 10 years before it was implanted in Copacabana. So the symbols of identity in a cultural landscape were not from the natives, were from outsiders, but not tourists, artists from outside. Because the artist has this capacity to communicate, to oscillating between the poles of this opposition. Also, this is Flamengo's Park. This is what Bula marks the, probably the most important landscape of, of Brazil. Um, he made this, a huge intervention, a huge artistic intervention in Guanabara Bay. He dumped part of Guanabara Bay. Nowadays, he would be in prison because he dumped a place that is a heritage of the human kinds. Now, at this time, when Burlamax did this park, the park itself became the word of heritage. It is included in the, in the UNESCO um, list. It's, it's really a, an amazing park with native, uh, we are in time, sure. yeah? Well, I'm, can I conclude this in sure. one minute? Or 10. Oh, oh. <laughs> not 10, but anyway. This is, another, this is another contribution for foreigners. Pão de Açúcar Teleferic, very well known. This is not a, an artist interpretation of the reality, but anyway, uh, it provides possibility to see the Guanabara Bay, it's amazing. Uh, but the, the heritage is not only physical, it's the, the characters are also heritage. This is a painting from uh, Jean-Baptiste Debré, um, a French painter that went to Brazil and register the existence of those street vendors. These street vendors existed till today. On the beach you see today with the clothes, of, with the Copacabana waves there. And also the artist, oh, these two, kind, these two vendors, one of um, um, tapioca cook and the other of mat, they are municipal heritage in Rio de Janeiro. Everybody knows this, including the tourists. And this is an artist, Aliso, that uh, used to perform with, uh, you see, those are planets. They put a planet, they designed it with uh, um, board cards. And uh, with this, he walks along, along the streets, in, or I mean, any cities in Brazil. It's a great artist, Ali Soto. Well, but anyway, there is many artists and arts that do not, that are not incorporated in a heritage. This is a very important uh, Spanish artist that did this uh, head, that put it in front of Sugarloaf, and uh, it was uh, withdrawn from the Botafogo Beach two months uh, later under a lot of criticism. Well, the curious, uh, he did this other, uh, the Crown Fountain, which is a heritage of Chicago. He's a great artist, but people, the, pop, the population, the audience, did not identify it with this. First, because he put Iemanjá as a, a black god. Gods, but in fact, the god, the goddess, is not black; is white. It was a goddess of black people, but it was a white woman. 
and he did not understood this uh, meaning of uh, a goddess of Afro-Brazilian uh, people. Again, Ale Soto, with his uh, cardboard in New York, make a performance, always walking with this cardboard. It's a kind of irony with the metropolization of metropolis of New York. And this is a sticker that another artist uh, pasted in a series of uh, uh, areas in the old Rio. You're gonna see some others, three more others rapidly. This is the inflatables of Hugo Richard. He did it this in the center of Rio. And uh, everybody loved this. It was a public identification with this. Just the contrary of the big head, the big blue head that the Spanish guy put in the Botafogo Beach. Again, the inflatables of Hugo Richard and the relationship between the ephemeral of the inflatable and the permanent of a museum. And that's curious because the inflatable is uh, bigger than the museum, bigger than the permanent. Uh, again, uh, Ali with the cardboard, uh, again doing uh, irony with the metropo metropolization, metropolis. But I would love to show you this engraves of João Sanchez that uh, he produces and uh, pastes in a lot of streets in the city. This is very well known in Rio. And also this sticker of Pedro Sanchez. But the most important for me is <coughs> the street art in the Fagot. Because I'm quite sure, I'm really quite sure that uh, in the future, what will be the heritage of Rio de Janeiro will be the favelas and not the huge uh, tourist events of World Cup and uh, Olympics. And this is a street art inside the favela. And that's really uh, very beautiful from my point of view. I choose this to finish my presentation because I do believe that the most important is just to connect with the native guys and to extract from them those aspects that could be in the future universal. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. I would um, go on to Refunk if you want to, to set up the presentation and then all questions yeah, we'll can come at the end. Since he's been here in Germany for a year, I believe or so, um, with the Silos, which is out here, um, he lives there, um, he created the space. Um, originally an architect and artist and um, yeah he built this silos in uh, the Netherlands and, and came here is based here and works a lot on what well, he presented the other day his work um, on the reuse and refunctionalization of certain objects that are um, left abandoned what do we do with them if you want to okay we have to start your presentation thank you I will take you very quickly and roughly through a huge amount of images of uh, our world without a manual because we look at everything in a different way as architects who work mainly with leftover materials. This means we are something in between art, architecture and design and I will show you what heritage is a connection for us. So I will always, will always come back in the lecture at some point and I will just flood you with hundreds of images so that you can't remember anything. <laughs> so the, 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 the word where we come from, it's refunk, it comes from the re, which means again in Latin. The funk is the function because we're architects, we're not artists in the sense everything is based on functions and the word fun means that we play 
with problems what people have in their public space, wherever it is. It means the heritage of a chair is that we ask, we go into a deep conversation with the chair. The chair says, I don't ever want anyone to sit on me again and fart and do whatever things. And, and we say, okay, so you become a table and the chair says, oh, that would make me happy. So that's our piece of conversation. And the same that a friend of ours, he has a shop, a gallery in The Hague, and he was not allowed to put a bench in front because the sidewalks in Holland are very narrow. And the city asks money if you want to put a bench in front of your shop. So, but we asked the city the question, what about if we put a lot of bikes in front of the shop? Because bikes are allowed everywhere, right? And the city said, yes. So we made a mixture of a bike and a chair, and the problem was solved. And this is in Africa. We experimented and see what comes out if you cross a garbage bin and a bike. The same that we solve issues because this is um, probably one of the most sold chairs worldwide, one of those models. You find them everywhere, mostly in the garbage. People just use them and then they don't even need to be broken, they get thrown away in huge amounts. So we had to solve an issue for Manifesta, the art exhibition in Belgium. They had considerably almost zero budget and they wanted 500 chairs. So we bought a stock of those chairs and changed them in height and made holes into them so they became interactive family and everyone could carry their chair on the art exhibition, low ones, high ones, and become groups. So there were chairs became groups, but the people as well. And this is actually the story, what I had to think about, one of our projects in Lithuania, where the term heritage came quite close to us, even closer than we ever wanted and thought. Because it's, it's, for me, it's a human thing. It's not what you leave physical, at least from this momentary view now, but what you leave for each other. So what do you leave behind, but what do you take away? So it's about lives and memories, and about humans as well. Because if we kill each other, there's going to be less of us left and less memories, and the heritage is definitely influenced. And as people talk a lot about friendly users, which is our term for user-friendly, it's a wrong perception because a user, the product might be user-friendly, but what if the user is not friendly with the product? It can end up like this, that people use a definitely user-friendly car and drink and drive. So we did a project in Lithuania, which mostly used to end like this, and it still does. We were commissioned by the government of Lithuania to erect a sculpture made from cars in which people died because of drunk driving to put a monument and we decided to use really cars in which people had deadly or deadly accidents. We created a little chapel as a monument for one month. We had it opened by the highest priest of Lithuania and he even agreed with us to do this, which was very surprising. So there for a month and it caused huge discussions between bicycle activists, car drivers, and the most controversial point that the main, or the biggest vodka producer in Lithuania sponsored the project. <laughs> Not with alcohol, but with the sense that drink our product, but ask someone else to drive then. And for us it's important to do things together with each other. This means you sit on a garbage dump, this is Denis and me, I, I'm still having much more hair than now. Uh, different ways of communication. There's always a way which you can find out, experiments, uh, play with children just with hands. The connection in the end makes up the memories which goes in the long run to the heritage. This is on gypsy camps how we developed toys for gypsy children. First they throw, they put knives on your belly, they throw the stones, but after a while you get really close and everyone gets happy because you, you do something together and not just for someone. And surprise is an element which is always the most beautiful thing every day. For example, in Siberia, an American might think this is a policeman in this. Dead one, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can read Cyrillic, this is pronounced Musa and means garbage. So this was definitely a story which came to me. I did not find it. And these two ladies in Latvia surprised me for, probably still, still till now, that they didn't agree in the morning. They 
just probably our neighbors and walk next to each other, but this is just incredibly beautiful that this exists. <laughs> and then there's garbage, which might look like this. For us, it's a beautiful playground. For other people, it's a problem. And it can look like this. And then there's architecture, which I think the perception is definitely wrong in many cases. So for me, perfect architecture is the placenta out of which Luca, who's sitting right here, was born. It's her house in that sense. It has the perfect temperature, has the perfect climate. It has food, it grows, it changes with you. It, it does everything what you need. So that's a good architecture in the sense that a Lithuanian man who was working in a brick factory and his neighbor worked in a wood factory. They both could not buy old, but only steal what's left over. And the result is two little barns for the tools in their gardens because it's made without architects. And that's the beauty of the creation. Just a little reference to the favela, of course, that things grow and not being planned, which I find the real beauty. And the same is in Siberia, I found out on the left corner, you see down the window has been planned. The window upright <laughs> has not been planned. It just was necessary. When you look further upright, they needed ventilation as well. And I really love this kind of do-it-yourself architecture. The same as in Northern Africa and Tunisia, they found out that four meters under the ground you have all year long 16 degrees, which is a perfect sleeping climate. So they just made holes in the ground. I mean, it's probably not good for people who are addicted to alcohol and come home in the dark. <laughs> but I really liked it and Star Wars got very inspired. They did a lot of shoots in these zones. And for us it's interesting what's left over. What do we leave behind? When you see far on the right side, the drilling rigs from oil, they get old, but this little escape pod is being not used longer than 10 years, and then they need new ones, so we decided to buy some of them and call them a extreme hotel. It's a capsulehotel.com, Lonely Planet puts it as one of the craziest hotels in all over the world, and it's just a fishing net in there, you have zero comfort, but the experience is definitely very, very interesting. And it's about listening opposite what I'm doing now, I'm talking. When we start a conversation with wood, for example, Denis, my partner, is holding a plank which can't be used because it's not straight. So we start a conversation with a plank. And you get into different situations than you think. This is, for example, another conversation with a metal pole. This is in uh, Breslavia in Poland. And the pole used to carry a big commercial ad, but it was there waiting for something new. And we had a group of girls who never worked with tools. My partner Damian shows them how to hammer. We had 30 pallets and one week. And we should create an art piece which should last for 30 days, for one month. So we just made a platform. We worked and worked and it became suddenly a structure which came very close to the Orthodox church just around the corner, which we didn't even think about. Mm -hmm. And all the people really enjoyed it. It became a public space. The children played it. The, the gangsters were smoking their marijuana inside. Mm -hmm. Everyone enjoyed the shape. So <laughs> in the end, we couldn't take it away. When we were supposed to take it down, the newspapers started to get active. Uh, people came. And then we got all permissions, what you ever want from the city, without even doing anything, no drawings, just to keep it there. But the day when we came, after three months, it was very fragile. Two drunk men had a lot of fun and destroyed it just the day we came. So the three days we had to reinforce this was day and work, day and night, always working. Then the snow came. So it, was, it didn't make it easier to work on an inclining ground. Our welder, as a tall Polish man, fell ten times with his welding torch in his hands. And we didn't give up. It was light work. In the end, the snow came all the way and it was winterproof, people could use it. The bridge actually, you don't see anymore, it got stolen after a week. Somebody needed some firewood, but I understand it's cold in winter. I mean, come on. <laughs> so this is the reason why somebody comes and steals wood from this object. So we came back this year and it looked like this. It was still alive. This is Karo, my Polish friend. We decided to give it a third year and now I have a deal with the government of the city of Wrocław that they have to come every year between Feb December and January and, and fix the onion that it's in a publicly acceptable state. 
and we decided it's not just fixing, so we used paint and we thought red is the best base color for gold, so we really decided to make it a golden onion. And I'm very curious what will happen next year. <laughs> this is how things last, which are not meant to last, which is actually really beautiful. When you do a project which is made for 25 years, probably after two years somebody comes with a lot of money or some good reason and breaks it down. When you make something for a week, it might last for all your life. So, and we are very, people think we are recycling architects and we very much don't like this word anymore. We call it the green sauce. You just put a green label, a green sauce over products and you can sell it for twice the price. And everybody thinks it's good. But recycling, except for glass maybe, means you transport things from A to B to C to D. Everything you don't want, you ship to Africa or to China, which you keep very quiet. And then you destroy everything, the structure, you just, you even shorten the fibers. And then you put a lot of energy and make a new product and say it's good. I don't mean this is for everything, but there's a big question mark about the word recycling. So we, that's why we call each other refunk, which is an extension of the life cycle of what is left over and not just a violent semi-destruction to create something else. For example, the blades from windmill offshore parks are used about 15 years and then they're not safe anymore. The value of each blade is about 200 euros after 15 years. So we bought four and made a flying container for a music festival. Of course the transport is a bit more expensive than the price of the wing itself. And then we re reused it again for a little festival where we have wonderful objects for playing, for climbing. And there's a lot of them on the planet and no one really thinks what can you do with windmill blades and I guess it's time for it. And we always proclaim don't design. So you come somewhere and you see people just make solutions for problematics. We worked in Africa and the man who take care about the little church in the township, his sofa was broken, you see, we used a car tire and fixed it, so we had a friend. The neighbors who gave us electricity had electricity problem, I fixed that, and we had power and more friends. We created a little add-on roof for the children in the crash, there was not enough space. The great thing is that the gangsters sat on it at night and the chickens slept at it in the morning, so Suddenly you have three functions and you think only about one, which is... And then we had a lot of friendship and songs and we made chairs in return for the show. And what we did in Africa, in Southern Africa, that we asked children after school, when they come to us, each of them bring one tire and they, they cleaned all the surrounding of the roads where you see tires and the environment everywhere. So it was really, really good, but in the end we didn't realize how many tires are everywhere just in the landscape. So after a few days we had to say, no tires today. <laughs> it just went totally out of hand. It became a business. And a kitchen extension for the ladies. We went further to this material. You find outside in this park where we are now a lot of car tire chairs. So they come out of our hand and everyone carries them wherever they want. We look different and that's what we like. So for most people it's just a car battery. But we read, who are you, says the car battery to us. So there's a conversation with any object possible if you understand the other kind of language. It's the same as the man in Kyrgyzstan who probably wanted to transport an elephant who really made us <laughs> think for a long time. <laughs> and this is in Kyrgyzstan, in uh, Bishkek, it's a connection. Wood, wood, how to make a bench with two trees without using any metal. It's just you let it grow into each other, which was very, very impressive. I mean, I don't know, but many years you will need some chair to go up or if it goes somewhere, but it's, it might rise and change. It's definitely an interesting way. We had a, a pitch in Holland to make a, an art piece on the river, and we didn't agree with the, the papers they asked us to send in because we refused to make a design, because they asked us that we need to guarantee 25 years of caretaking within our budget. So we just refused that and just wrote the plan that we don't design anything, but we just calculated that the neighbor who costs 25 euros an hour, who comes for half a day, once a month, to take care and paint our artwork. And with that calculation, after 25 years, two thirds of the budget was just gone for caretaking. So we decided to use something which has vanitas, which is allowed to pass away and it's just go with time and after 25 years it will be gone or at least something left but if people make graffiti 
or anything is allowed. Everything is already in the plan. So we use breakwater blocks, but not in the water. So the people in the park really like those elements because now you're able to touch them, to block the roads for cars that only the passengers can go through. The cows agreed as well, so I thought this is a Dutch painting by Vermeer. <laughs> and then people always talk about workshops, and that's our general... Now we actually disagree that a workshop should be with dirty hands and material, and you sit and you have tools and you make noise and you play in open air or just go the way you feel and touch some and communicate, but when you meet and talk and have a discussion, for us it's more of a talk shop. So that's just our own terminology. Workshops, they mostly look like this when we are being invited somewhere. This is in Venice, which is the most illogical place to work with car tires, but they really insisted. So we had, we had to fight at night to not get our tires stolen, which are chemical garbage for the rest of the world. But in Venice, the ships, they use them as fenders. Very interesting moment. And we did a lot of experimental shelters with groups of youth and car tires. This is in the south of England. Swings is one of my biggest fascinations, how to make different kind of swings that everybody can make at home. So we entered Johannesburg. We lived in the inner city for three months. Uh, I've never had one single problem because I don't like prejudice about don't go there. And you ask the person, have you been there? No, it's too dangerous. So, okay, so I go and you make friends. And we made a lot of friends by inviting the children to use our swings. So we had a lot of parents and they all showed us their neighborhood and their streets. In uh, Mafikeng, in the north of South Africa, there was, uh, when it was, last football world championship? Yeah, it was, no, it was eight years ago. We had a stadium which was not used for the football cup. So we had to program it and it's a city. The game is so big, so what we did, we used the structure of the stadium and made swings, really big swings for a lot of people. And this is the swing for 30 people, it was mostly used by 50. <laughs> and you end up in a, in a beautiful playground, of course you can only do this in Africa, of course people stood there and waited for the swing, but it's probably three or four tons which might hit you, so we had to invent bumpers to minimize the impact, and it's still being used. This is an experiment how to look at your city in a different way, from a different angle. In Budapest, we had, I think, 25 garbage bins, cleaned them, made one hole in the bottom, one above. And we invited people just to join us on the streets. And they even had children around them because they were so curious what's there to discover. You see your own city just by the pavement. And we took them on tours. We used the bin. We put a lot of them and just waited until people came and got curious. We marked a water line and we had them for 20 minutes walking over streets with cars. Everything was totally fine. You actually see the reaction of visitors. They see the wet little water line. We actually had a problem with two polished grounds in front of the National Library. So some of the bins entered the library and people enjoyed it so they don't take the head off because you're really in this other world. And at night, of course, we put lights so they can still find their way home. <laughs> and then there's, for me, the, the heritage of furniture, because you sit on chairs, which have beautifully been used second time. They come from an old school here in Berlin. I know that story. I don't know more about these chairs. But often people have one chair which they really don't appreciate any longer. And there's this word ugly, which just suddenly changes that you don't like your t-shirt anymore, you take it out, you say I want something else after probably a month or a year or ten years. But it's, it's still a fascination why this happens. So the person next door probably finds this chair not very beautiful anymore and puts it outside. So what's for us to do is obvious. We just take those two chairs and we create two new chairs which of course look like this and the other one looks like that. Fascinating is that both of the people suddenly want the chairs back. <laughs> And this is an example about what happens when everyone throws away their refrigerator. It looks like this in front of a refrigerator recycling plant in Lithuania. And they asked us, do you have an idea? Because we have complaints, it looks really, really not appealing. So we said, why don't you take away all the mechanics, the cooling liquids, the doors, and you give us those fridges as Lego, and we start playing. And we were 
I think eight of us, and we had ten days. So we just started to stack them. We found out that we are quicker than them to produce the fridges for us. We went on, we made windows to the landscape. This is the backbone, how it's constructed. And in the end, it became an architectonical sculpture of 800 fridges, 100 meter long, 5 meter high. But that was still not enough. Because then we decided that they need a new logo. So we put light in it and we called it the Frixel, which is a mix of a fridge and a pixel. <laughs> and then the light thing, it's always it's fascinating, it's really simple. You just use, this is in Terni in Italy, it's on a bridge where it's the only bike path of a very car-based city. And we had two old bikes, uh, garbage bins, water tanks, car battery and a few LED lights and we made a mobile bar that you can bring bicycle to the bridge and open up and we had a lot of happy people because we had free drinks of course. It's another example how you can create with just garbage with a bit of light and a little bit of creative idea about space. This is the library for the Manifesta exposition last year. Or you put light inside of a normal plastic pallet, two, two TLC lamps and put wrapping plastic around it and you get to light effects that people think it's electronics, it's interactives. It's LEDs in there, and you always say yes, of course, so they believe in this wonderful high-tech, but it cost us less than 50 euros, and we make it in one hour each, and we use them year and year, and it's just beautiful to play with a lot of light effects in a minimalistic way, but never admit, don't, don't tell your secrets, because it makes people unhappy. So we made restaurants from that, or expositions. And the other thing is palettes. On the whole planet, you find more than 250 different kinds of pallets. And a lot of them are reused, but definitely not enough. So whenever you go and there's no material, you say, get us a bunch of pallets. This is a workshop in Poland. We made children pallets. That was the first thing, because there were a lot of children bored on a design fair. People go and read and stand in front of this furniture and never touch, stay away, and people had to hold their children back. It was a beautiful playground. So we said, let's do something for the children. They liked our pellets, because they can carry them. Then we thought, what about going mobile? So we went to the hardware store, bought a lot of wheels. We caused a lot of confrontation with the securities, with the fire department, and every day we loved to play this game, because they really had a problem with us. There was everywhere children running around on mobile pellets. <laughs> all this expensive furniture in the middle, that was a beautiful show. Nothing happened. And we made mobile seats. This was made from one pellet for the, the parents and the visitors as well. Because there was nowhere to sit on a furniture exhibition where you could sit on the bench, which I actually <laughs> found a bit weird. And this is another example of an adventure playground in Warsaw, which actually lasted for a year. And we extended just to activate public spaces with pallets. And people just come by themselves and program it. It's another game with pallets in. St. Petersburg, because it's not allowed to touch the art piece, and securities are very strict in Russia. So we made the art piece that you almost have to walk on it, because it's kind of like a staircase, which definitely worked. And this is in Siberia, where public space is really hard. You see, actually, that the flowers are where the flowers are supposed to be. The bench are where you sit public space you walk where it's pavement so there was no dynamics uh, we just used a bit of car tire chairs you can move them around we made a podium from pallets invited a band to play filled water bottles with concrete made a car tire ball so you can play public bowling which worked the children played their games so it's just about changing the perception about spaces borders elements the auditorium was very, very minimal, but people really started to give performances in the middle. The girls with their high heels wanted us to create a, a Carrera circuit, like an eight they can walk around, which made definitely no sense, but it was <laughs> a good show because it's on the grass. Mm -hmm. So we activated the, the grass by pellets and corners to sit and hang around. Just the quality to not pass in public space, but to, to be and stay. And what's well, definitely a weird point of heritage are 
toilets because there's something what you always leave behind <laughs> by the matter of a toilet. But what happens with the toilets? I mean, you leave your, your bacteriums are probably washed away, but you still had. Can you imagine how many times in your life you go to the toilet? I never thought about it until now. But it's the point in Lithuania. We've been asked in a very posh village on the coast where a lot of people come for bathing. We were asked by a curator to work with toilets in public space. And I thought, this is almost impossible. I love it. So we agreed to do it. Then we started plastic surgery on toilets. What can you get out of a toilet when you start to cut it? We developed cutting techniques. And the dogs came out. There was one result, which was suddenly loved in public space. Of course, the most dangerous moment was this one when the garbage came and they crossed our workshop. And then, if, if I had gone to toilet for one minute, the whole project could have been over. And in the end, we found out that the benches in public space had no armrests and they were white. So there was definitely a challenge to just clean them really well and see what happens. And people really took it. So. And the Lithuanian president came to visit us. She shook my hand, but didn't want to be photographed on one of those seats, which I definitely understand. It's very politically correct. What we left was those kind of objects in public space. And there were people hanging, sleeping, so... <laughs> it is possible. The police even took it as something which has to be there. And the last story I would like to tell you is the story about my own house. Yeah, that involves you as well, Luca. Because when you're a smaller being or a creature, as a grown-up, you see things different, so... I developed from an old grain silo a house for myself, which I can carry with me, like a snail, so it has to be mobile, so it can't be bigger than a truck size. And still, I found a farmer which could not live on the products he produced, like his milk and meat. So he started to collect and trade with grain silos. Animal foods normally start, so he had this space full of them, which looks like on Mars, and I got inspired and made a few ideas, what could you do with a grain silo? I bought the biggest and oldest one he had. He ever went to his space, and you see, ah, it's a space. But I didn't like the horizontal orientation, you get too much to a caravan or a camper, the, the space is definitely not there. After I lived two years in a caravan, I found out that you always have cold feet and two warm hands, <laughs> that the acoustic insulation is definitely zero. And the space, you can't even stretch your arms. And when your Dutch friends, which are mostly tall people, come to visit you, they talk to you like this. So <laughs> I knew what I had to do. I, I love the evolution of a caravan, how practical you can spend all your life without moving your foot position. But still, there's no space existing. So this was supposed to be the new space. The farmer asked me 300 euros for the silo, including the steel frame, and brought it even because he liked the project. A friend of ours who has a truck with a crane came to help to put it up. And you see it's rather small. Each of the people around had completely finished ideas of what you can do, how you can make a house from this. So I didn't need to draw any plans because everyone had changed. People in the harbor, in Scheveningen, where I lived in Holland, the, the technical equipment people from the ships came and said, oh, you can do like this, or you can put the window here, oh, we help you to insulate. So the story was... Ongoing, so I just put the window and say it's a house. Made a little sketch to see how can you actually put yourself into a space. And my youth dream was always to have a bathtub in the ground. It's a bit like Japanese style. Not even for water, just to put your feet into it. And then Luca came. She was then four. Now she's almost Five. eight. Five, okay, Five sorry. Correct it. <laughs> And you see, we just started to put the floor and her comments were inspiring because space is a definition about how tall you are, how big you are, how you perceive it, your experience with space. The students from the local academy came. My assistant made a balcony. And I was surprised that eight people in only a space of 4.2 square meter have a comfortable time in the talk, which I didn't try before. So we kept on cutting it open. You see a frame which tells us this is the maximum what a truck can take without special permissions. My birthday came, I invited my friends, 
There were 26 people inside. <laughs> On two levels at that time. Now we have three. I learned chemistry to deal with this polyester material, what the silo is made from. The storms and the rain came, so we had to learn hard lessons. Don't ever try this outside again. And then the snow came, which didn't hit Holland for 50 years as much as that year. I think it was 2012. And the winter made, actually gave us a gift of 50 centimeters of snow for one month. Because rain dries, but snow stays, so we are totally blocked and had a wonderful time to think and work on the interior. And here you see all the mistakes which have been repaired and cut again when the window went to the wrong place, which is of course part of a dynamic process. This is the result which you can see outside here at ZKU and the interior. So you see still the grain silo, there's no space for stairs, so we have a climbing wall. And there's, you see a little bucket which brings all the goods like a cup of tea upstairs or downstairs because while you climb you have no hands free, which makes you realize that your mouth is what you can carry. Or you have a lift, we have a fireplace, it's basically everything what you need on what, 14 square meter on three levels. Luca found out that in the corner where the door opens on the upper floor is enough space for her. I did not consider this as a space. And she said, if you make a little folding table for me, I hope you don't need to correct me now, <laughs> that she wants to have the view to see the ships that she can make the drawings. So the children's room designed itself in that sense. And this is the sleeping department upstairs. And this was the interaction and the result with the city behind. This could be Greece. <laughs> and the view, which I do miss, the staircase and the lift. And you see on the right side, I spent two years in the caravan to learn how to make a different kind of mobile house with a quality of space. And then the big moment came, the truth, yeah. Because people put a lot of furniture with wheels and they say they're mobile, but I don't believe if you don't move something, it's not mobile, it's just an illusion. So the crane came and it was definitely a scary moment. Everything went well. Everybody liked it, a spaceship in the air. And they said, just leave it horizontal, it looks rather good like this. We were only stopped once by the police because they thought it might be really, really heavy and from steel. That was the only concern. We were only three centimeters next to the car, which was not allowed. But my truck driver told me, put the little exhaust on the right side because nobody ever passes us on the right because the truck is slow and I really like the logic. <laughs> and this is here at KU. I put my tools, the water tanks for the ballast, everything else I needed into a shipping container in the silo. So I basically packed my whole life. My administration, my company, my materials, my tools, my clothes, my private behaviors, my, my possessions, everything I really think I would need I had to take it one move with me after 15 years in Holland, which is quite a history. And then you put it back up, and the beautiful thing is a mobile house, which is almost round. You twist it with one hand when it's hanging on the truck, and you think, oh, where's the sun? Where's the view? And you keep on twisting and say, okay, now you look around, and yeah, it's good. Oh, wait one second. And you twist it another centimeter, and then you put it down. We opened the windows, we put the water tanks, I brought some chairs from Holland, as you saw before. We called out an opening party. Luca was singing songs for the visitors. <laughs> and we had a lot of guests, and we leave our door open on a weekday, mostly even on weekends. We have people just coming in. I admit it doesn't look like a house, maybe more like a play installation. Yesterday there were so many children around that we even had to leave because we couldn't handle the questions and the amount and the <laughs> shaking on the house, which is just curiosity, but it was too much for us. And you get visitors from different zones. <laughs> <laughs> they need the space for landing, so we had the police, oh no, the fire department and the rescues, and school children from a class visiting us, climbing. The winter came and definitely worked out. We never had it cold. We found a lot of firewood. People took the space as, you could say it's a mosque now, but it's not. 
And then we developed a garden in France, so we are not really as mobile as you think anymore. Two weeks ago there was open house here at ZKU, and we thought it would be great to have a pizza oven. So we used stones from the streets, and we started to bake pizza. And then we had the idea that we could use a water tank, cut it open, put a pipe and a spiral to it, an old spring from a machine, and just put fire in it. And after three hours, it was a steam bath. This means people just took their clothes off. First they were in underwear, later they were all naked and having a steam bath <laughs> in the middle of public space. So it was definitely a rewarding element. And it looked like a little festival. There was an installation by the OSC, Australian group. So the whole ZKU was one night festival zone. And the last thing I want to tell you about what kind of weird heritage we can create by not speaking the language and not understanding each other is a story from Mexico. There was in the registry of official names, two new names appeared. Nobody knew where they came from. People speak mostly Spanish and no English. And a lot of boys are called in Mexico now Uznavi and Uzarmi. So, and now you see where it came from, because later they discovered it's the t-shirt, and if you read it in Spanish, it's Uznavi, and I find the name quite nice. So, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>
and innovate heritage. Uh, you were very uh, almost wonderful when you thought about this innovate heritage because uh, basically the heritage is no thing. And now we are talking about new things. We are about to innovate in the old things and to steal things that could be the future and heritage. We never know. It could be a, a tomato can, like it was in the case of Andy Moreau, you know, that transformed a common thing in a kind of celebrity, or vice versa. You've got Marilyn Moreau that was a celebrity and transformed it in a common thing and reproduced it a lot of time. That's nice. I see, I see, I was thinking when I was working on my paper, I was thinking, wow, well, because we changed it a little bit, because uh, at, at the beginning it would be a, a conversation with uh, uh, Juan Chen, Juan Chen and uh, it would be much more about tourism and things like this. And then I, I had already done something on my resource and I, I also began to think about the, the, the thoughts of Wang Chen. And then I was informed that um, uh, it was necessary to change because uh, Wang Chen had a problem with the visa and things like this. And I sent you an email and say, wow, that's wonderful because this kind of issues of refund <coughs> is going to be uh, very close with the question that I would love to I would love to, to put in on the table. So, great. No, it is beautiful to see the connection because I, I see the, the link we call it always the, the art tourism and the tourism and terrorism is for us quite close. <laughs> because you invade and, and I, I really like your point of view. I mean, it's the same how the, the, the safari things happen. And, but for us, even architecture is... Uh, is a terrorist as itself because we come from the background of architecture and many architects create situations or buildings they don't realize. A painting on the wall you can take down or even destroy it or just put it in the basement, but a house, you're facing it yeah. 50 years. And I think when they design houses, they would not live themselves in, you should hang the architect on the facades. Uh -huh. because if you force architects to live in the dwellings they create, there would be such a different kind of architectonical yeah. sculptures coming and, and, and I miss the, well you're just wealthy and you have your own secure place and you do your work and, and what we discovered in different places where we work that the more, it's not about poverty, but when you have nothing, from whatever background you come, you get extremely good and improvisation has an enormous, enormous race, that's why of course the, slums in, in India and in South Africa, in, in Brazil, the creativity is incredibly high because yeah. it has to be. Yes. There's no other way to survive and that's what I love. But it's, it's about creativity in, in everyday things. There's a beautiful book about the Russian inventions in the last 50 years. It's all about things this big. And there's people who found out that there's no light switch. They just, they just needed, no, they had a light switch but no socket for power. So they just opened the the light switch on the top, on, on the ceiling, there was a connector for the lamp and they created adapters that you put a bulb in, but it has no bulb, but it has a power plug in it. Mm -hmm. And it's just genius little things, how to make a knife into a fork, mm -hmm. and, and that's actually the real quality, and they're not even considered inventions because they're so logical and so practical, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't forget that that makes life beautiful, the, the things you touch every day. Yeah, well, I cannot lose the opportunity to say that I'm, I'm an architect too. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I, I was, at the beginning I was a social scientist because I had double formation as a social scientist and then later as an architect. And I realized that uh, this opposition could be, that I could oscillate between these two poles of this uh, opposition too. Then um, it came to me two things. The analytical aspect of the social scientists and the synthetic aspects of, of the uh, architects. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, for instance, you have uh, talked about uh, this kind of bricolage. Bricolage, as you know, is a, a French word that was recovered by Levi Strauss, a very famous anthropologist, that recovered the bricolage as a way of thought. So do bricolage is to think. And that's amazing how people had to solve questions. Once I was in a big university in the United States where I have studied, and uh, the guy was talking on how could a poor guy coming from a favela in Brazil uh, study in this university. It would be difficult for him to solve all the problems. And I said, well, I, I can imagine how difficult, how difficult it would be for you to <laughs> go to a favela and survive there. Uh, you're probably going to be uh, uh, killed. Because it yeah. would be necessary. And that's curious because you had said that uh, you went to some poor areas and poor district in Mexico. I think you had said one place that. Johannesburg. Johannesburg. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and that's very curious because there is a lot of people capable to go. I, well, I lived there, so for me it was a little bit easy. I, went to do some work with people in favelas in Rio, and uh, I know, and that's exactly what occurs, that you became friends of these people, and they, and you became to understand all the things in, in this kind of environment, and you can, you can live here without any problem. But if you came there with a kind of exotic gaze, so, uh, uh, it's mm -hmm. going to feel mm -hmm. difficult. Huh? But uh, that's interesting. That's the, the, the most interesting for me is to think what is going to be heritage in 50, 100 years. What I agree with you is about connection with the people. I mean, if you go somewhere and you, you put some of your, you even create a school for them, when you come 20 years later, the school might be gone or something changed, but if you that they might remember you. So it's, it's more or less for us, the, the connection, what you build up with local people, and that makes unsafe places very safe. When I go to a place, I feel not safe. I just look at the person who stands at the corner and sells food. I just take the arm of that person and say, you're my friend now, and then calls me down, and then I look around <laughs> and say, who's your friend? And someone else and buys a sandwich, who's really nice, I can I walk with you? <laughs> and then you, you go and you make connections, and I notice that it's, it's a human, future because I noticed that people pay a lot of money into systems to take care when they're old and I had a discussion with a very rich friend of mine who doesn't do it, who has its own company, it's a garbage advisor and it's about human research which is the investment in the future because when you're old you can have good friends to take care about you so there's very many different ways to see what will the future be and what will be left and what we do invest with our time and our power. So would you like to hear something? just realized that in my family, for example, we had this uh, habit of not throwing away stuff because you never know when mm -hmm. you might need it for something. And it actually stays with you then, um, this practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, now for me, it has also maybe a, a more creative um, function because I like also to play with it. But for my family, I mean, for my mother or for my grandmother, it was really a necessity and um, to reuse objects. And it's interesting how 
comes or it's um, passed from one generation to the other, like the heritage, um, yeah, we want to preserve and yeah, just uh, I found it interesting, this parallel. I think it's a philosophy, not everyone can understand it. Yeah, yeah because... because my father likes the place to clean and not anything, because, yeah. not because he might die one day, but it's, it's just a, a discomfort to have stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at it as stuff and things, not comforting you, but for yeah. when I come to the basement of my uncle and collected all these metal pipes and these things, it's paradise for me. I can start to create immediately, and in, even on the streets of cleany, tidy Japan, you find people grow plants and flowers in almost any kind of object which has the capability of a pot. If it's from yogurt, a car parts, uh, the tidiest families do this. It's a big Japanese tradition. In all the houses you see these buckets or coffee cups or everything full of little plums and I think then you speak a language and it's, it's a philosophy and an expression and it can be a future, it's just the question who, who is able and who wants to be able to speak that language. semicircular plastic balls. They get two, put one over another, seal it, paint it, and put in the heads. And that becomes an amazing contribution to the soccer games in the World Cup. And uh, that's, that's uh, really amazing how people are creative in the sense that they can re-function uh, a lot of different things. Uh, in, in Rio, for instance, there is uh, an area that they call the Barracão, and uh, this is a big area like, like this space in here, for instance, where people from the um, Samba School you know what summer school is, the, the, the group that parade in the carnival, where the, the summer school do a lot of uh, creations, a lot, a lot of creations. 
he do amazing things with um, cups um, on, on cardboard with uh, those kind of um, plasticos that are there. They are capable to do some costumes that you cannot believe when you see them. And uh, that's, a, that's a great experience. I will talk with Catherine uh, uh, Delia that next time we're going to do the Innovate Heritage in Rio. <laughs> So we're gonna invite everybody there. Uh -huh. And uh, wow, I'm gonna look for some fun. <laughs> and uh, do this uh, conference there inside a barbacoon of uh, Sunday school. It's gonna be great. So we going where? In the favela or not? <laughs> no, 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 the barbacoon is not a barbacoon. Is not, oh, it could be in a favela. The barbacoon. It means this, this space is not an favela. But uh, people that work there are pe people, the community of the favelas, okay. from different uh, school of samba, mm -hmm. that goes there to do the work, to do the costumes. So uh, they take uh, something like six months. Because we are talking about um, 200,000 people parading in Rio. So you have to, to uh, do 200 costumes for different peoples with different sizes and uh, with different imaginations because the uh, Samba School is, uh, is like a, an opera. It has, um, it has dance, it has music, and also, there is a history on this. And uh, each scene of a school parade means something. Uh, for instance, in the case of the ball, again, uh, the idea was to communicate to the people that the Brazilian guys is always think about football. They are very poor. They have a lot of difficulties, have a lot of problems, but they live emotionally linked with carnival, with football, with a lot of different things. Well, well a lot of uh, intellectuals uh, say, uh, make uh, a lot of criticism, uh, saying that um, they should um, be more conscious about this difficult and things like this. I don't know if this is the right way to, to view the problem. Of course there is poverty, of course there is violence, of course, of course it is necessary to change the society, to reduce uh, inequalities. Of course, this is obvious. But the question is, you don't need to do this uh, unhappily. You can do this with some happiness. And that's the idea that uh, it's, it, well, I love the city. <laughs> um, I don't have a question, maybe more like a comment. I come uh, from Montenegro, it's a small country in the Mediterranean, and um, I'm a conservation architect. I work in the World Heritage Site of Kotor in Montenegro, and um, uh, with what you just said, a uh, way of changing things. Um, I'm actually thinking uh, how difficult our job, my job, has become uh, since um, the governmental policy in terms of conservation, not just government. Of Montenegro, but I would say uh, the United Nations and UNESCO as one of its uh, institutions and organizations is actually uh, uh, made our life and work so difficult because uh, these policies are so strict on some conservation principles and policy and 
uh, practices, but in uh, real life, we are actually, we in Kotor, we came to a situation where we are fighting our own people uh, because we are forbidding all the time that they shouldn't build or they shouldn't change or they shouldn't do this and that and all of that based on the higher policies or in this case of, of UNESCO. And I'm just wondering uh, because um, I just had a discussion with some colleagues a few days before